Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and this is Reality Asserts Itself. We're continuing our series of interviews with Bob Moses, who was one of the most influential leaders of the civil rights movement. He's the founder of the Algebra Project. He was also one of the leaders of the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project, and Bob joins us again in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So one more time, Bob is an educator, a civil rights activist during the 60s. He was the field secretary for SNCC. He also was an outspoken critic of the Vietnam War, and he's the founder of the Algebra Project, as I mentioned. He's also the author of Radical Equations, Civil Rights from Mississippi to the Algebra Project, and co-editor of Quality Education as a Constitutional Right, Creating a Grassroots Movement to Transform Public Schools. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So we're going to pick up where we were. I asked you at the end of the last segment what you learned from the sit-ins and then what effect that had on you. I knew that something big was going on, right, because I knew about my uncle, I knew about, you know, what, uh, the lynchings and stuff like that. So um, I went down to visit Uncle Bill on my spring break. And so at this point in my life, um, I've, I've been at Harvard, I've gotten an MA. So I graduate um, from Hamilton in 56. I spend a year at Harvard, I pick up my MA. I'm back there trying to get a doctorate when my mother passes, right? She's really still young, she's in her early 40s. My father uh, just um, goes, um, he deteriorates, right? And he ends up uh, in the hospital. So I leave, um, go back uh, to New York, and um, get a job eventually teaching at uh, Horace Mann School, teaching math. And I'm there when the sit-ins break out. And so I go down on my spring break to see my Uncle Bill. Go down where? To Hampton, Virginia, right? So the students at Hampton are marching, demonstrating in Newport News, right? So I march with them over and walk the picket line while they sit in. And Wyatt T. Walker comes down to do the mass meeting. Now, Wyatt eventually becomes the head of King's organization, right? Um, but right then, he's a, a minister in Petersburg. He announces that they're going to set up an office in Harlem to raise money for King. So um, I get all the information and go back and go to the organizing meeting. Bayard Rustin is running that organizing meeting and ran the office, right? And so I go down every afternoon after school um, and volunteer at the office. Right? I meet Jack O'Dell, who, who later becomes uh, King's uh, over his citizenship program, helping to run the program that Septima Clark developed in South Carolina. So um, they actually, um, Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier headline uh, the fundraising event. They do it at the armory where my father's working, right? The 369th Armory, right? And after the event, um, I asked Bayard if I can go down and work with King. I'm thinking he's still in Alabama. So he tells me, well, um, what, I'll send you to Ella Baker in Atlanta, right? So Ella was actually at that time King's executive director, right, of SCLC. And so I, I get down that summer uh, to Atlanta, and uh, there in uh, the office, Ella has a, a little room in the office. King uses his father's uh, office at the church. Uh, Dora is his secretary, and Jane, Jane Stembridge, is a young white volunteer uh, who had been at um, uh, the Union Theological Seminary. And came down to the meeting that Ella called that formed SNCC and volunteered to be the first executive secretary for SNCC. So she's in the office there. Um, we hit it off because philosophy and theology, right? We're talking all the time. Uh, and so that is where I learn about SNCC. Um, and that's where um, I begin the journey that eventually takes me to Mississippi. So what year are we in? So this is 1960. The sit-ins hit in February 1st, 1960. Uh, Ella had organized on Easter weekend in 1960 the conference uh, to bring the sit-in leaders together. Um, and she did that because um, Ella had been working across the South throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s. So she knew everybody. Um, who had actually worked in the South against 
leftist uh, racial de apartheid, right? So um, she made, through her contacts, got the sit-in leaders to come to her university as she graduated Shaw in uh, North Carolina, right? So at that meeting, she actually did something that um, impacted later all the work that I did, which was um, she uh, created a space um, that protected the organizers, the leaders of the sit-in from the older civil rights organizations that wanted them as a youth wing of their operation. Uh, so she kind of insisted and created a space so that they could come together and form their own organization. And that's how the SNCC uh, came into being. And, and that happened on that Easter weekend. And somewhere here, you decide, or it kind of happens, that this becomes your life? Well, what happens is um, the, what they do at the, they set up a coordinating committee. Um, Marion Barry uh, is the first chairperson. And while I'm working, I'm doing this volunteer work, I'm staying at the YMCA in Atlanta. Um, uh, the, the coordinating committee comes and has its first meeting that summer in Atlanta. Um, and they decide that they're going to have a conference in the fall for sit-in leaders from across the South. And Jane has to be the organizer for the conference, right? She's their secretary. And she comes to me and says, I have a problem. I don't have any names from Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana of any people who sat in or any kind of sit-in activity in those states. Um, and asked me if I will go scout, right? Um, so I agree. Um, she and Ella get together, and Ella knows all of the really NACP or SCLC leadership in those states, gives the contact information to Jane. Jane writes letters to them uh, saying that SNCC is sending uh, its field representative right, uh, to come. And uh, so I take off. They put me on a Greyhound bus. I take off. Talladega, Birmingham, Clarksdale, Cleveland, Jackson, Shreveport, New Orleans, um, and uh, Biloxi, Gulfport, Biloxi, Mobile, back to Atlanta. And now you'd been in New York. Clearly, there was a black world and a white world, but you'd been in this, uh, you know, elite education. But is this your first? real drenching in the deep south? Yeah, this is the first time. I mean, our family once, I, I know at least once, maybe twice, our whole family when we were young went down to visit Uncle Bill, right? Um, so how, how did that feel? What was the impression? Well, I was young, right? I'm no, I mean this, this trip This now. trip now? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm a scout, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm also somehow representing this uh, very militant sit-in organization. Uh, there's an expectation. Um, so at the bus stop in Atlanta, they're watching to see where I sit when I get on, right? So I sit up front until we get to the Georgia line, and I go back. So when the bus hit Anniston, which is where later the Freedom Rider bus was bombed, the highway patrol guy comes on, but I'm in the back. He can't tell me from anybody else, right? Um, when I go to Clarksdale, right, uh, Aaron Henry sees me off. Um, they're watching where I sit. I sit up front, but there no nobody else is on the bus, and so. Uh, um, but when I get to Cleveland, uh, Amzie, he's working at the post office. They've actually cut his hours down, so uh, he only works Saturdays, right? Um, but he, he's not home. I go over to the post office. But he tells me the rumor is that the Freedom Riders, that these sit-in riders uh, have come to town, right? So, um, but really, I'm really um, working as uh, a scout, 
undercover, so to speak. I'm I'm trying to be as inconspicuous as I but, can. But the your your now direct experience with you know, the apartheid. I mean, it's not that it doesn't exist in New York, but it doesn't exist to the extent it did in the South. Does any uh, how did, did that impress you in a specific way, or is it's kind of just what you expected? You know? Um, so, um, well, what I'm, l I'm being exposed to is, um, and really through AMSI, who is the first one who really begins to take me in, I spend several days there. Um, and AMSI is the one who tells us what we should do, right? I mean, he really is the one that, that says, he's sitting on, he's, be he's compiling the information about voter registration in the Delta, and it blows my mind because um, I've been to all these schools, but no one, uh, and we're talking about, you know, the Iron Curtain, people are giving lectures at Horace Mann and everybody, oh, these people have to vote over there in Eastern Europe and everything, and no one, nobody ever said anything about this congressional district in Mississippi, which is 80% black, in terms of eligible voters that has never sent a black person to Congress, right? Um, so it just blows my mind. And AMSI um, is plotting how, he's, how we're going to, and he sees the sit-in movement and the youth energy. He's the only one on that whole trip who really sees that uh, the energy is there now to take on Mississippi, right? And this, this becomes side. an issue of voter registration. There's many more potential black voters, but they're not being allowed to vote, essentially. Right, yes. So it's not sit-ins, right? So it's, it's no need to have direct action for, you know, sit-in activity um, here, what we really need. And AMC has, he has uh, a mind that has grown up and actually penetrated the mind of the white southern male men, right? So um, he has a real sense of what, what it needs and what it takes, how to turn the key that's going to unlock this thing. And what was it? Except, well, it's, what it turned out to be, and this piece of it AMZ didn't have, it turned out to be the National Democratic Party structure. Well, we're going to pick up this whole issue of voter registration and the, the Democratic Party and the fight within the Democratic Party as we continue Reality Asserts Itself with Bob Moses. Please join us for the next segment on Real, the Real News Network.